Cheers. Um, you're going to be disappointed if you come to see trout because essentially this is about carp and it's just a ploy. <laughs> it's just a ploy to, to, you know, to get, you, get you guys here. So anyway, um, Lake Crescent and Lake Sorrel, and I'll jump straight into it. Um, actually, what I'm going to talk about is essentially the, the issues around Lake Sorrel and Crescent and, and the, the fishery itself and why it declined or, or some of the things that went on. But I just want to focus on the carp issue and just flick through some, some trouty stuff at the end of it all. Um, so the, the pretty big, in Tasmanian context, they're pretty big lakes. Um, Lake Sorrel is um, 5,300 hectares, Lake Crescent 2,300. They're typically really shallow lakes and so they, they're um, prone to high turbidity. Um, the other thing too, they have these um, really quite big wetlands. You can't really see them here, the marsh and wetlands. And when these get inundated, the productivity of the lake just goes through the roof. Um, conversely, that when they're low, um, productivity of the lake, especially Lake Crescent, uh, just falls in a hole. And we'll just see a few examples of that. So anyway, um, the issues um, have been in the past European carp, both lakes hold a threatened uh, galaxid species, the golden galaxid that's listed federally and under state legislation. As I said, the shallow lakes become highly turbid, prone to uh, drought. So things like the El Nino um, is, an, is an issue and irrigation demands as well. And the other thing is, so obviously, there's a, a major recreational fishery, or has been, for both, in both these lakes. I, this is, um, I'm going to just step out here because this here is the um, number of anglers that fished Lake Sorrel uh, way back in the 90s. And in Tasmania, um, we had about 40% of all our freshwater anglers fishing in Lake Sorrel at one stage. And you can see this is an environmental issue and what's happened to the catch, oh sorry, the the numbers of anglers issue. Um, and later on, uh, Lake Sorrel becomes closed because of carp um, management actions. Uh, and Lake Crescent here, um, much, much lower partic participation, but the fishery for um, at Lake Crescent is based on these, these, these really big trout, these big suckers here. Uh, that was back in 1979 or something, and I think that probably went about 13 kilo. We don't have, we're not to that stage yet. So anyway, to give you an idea, Lake Sorrel, um, at one stage, uh, the harvest there was estimated to be 116,000 trout in the season. So a pretty productive place. So now we'll move to the carp part. And I'll try and flick through this, but um, not to bore you too much. But the, the main strategies were containment to those two lakes, um, examining and understanding carp, um, what they did, when they did it, why they did it, that sort of stuff, and develop methods and uh, equipment to target um, the carp there. And some of the equipment or, or methods were radio tracking, uh, implanting males, installation of barrier nets and fencing, targeting with uh, gill nets and widespread gill netting, electrofishing, spot poisoning, traps, fike nets. We even tried trawl gear at one stage, pheromone trials, and then there's been some eDNA work done as well. Um, and water manipulation was used early in the piece to try um, and prevent spawning. But most of all, um, it's been, I, 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 found, I uh, find it a bit hard to say this because I, I didn't do a lot of work on the CUP program, but Chris here, sitting here, he, he's been there for the, the whole time, 27 years. So a lot of bloody hard work and dedication to the cause. Um, and that's what's got, got um, basically got rid of CUP. I'm going to to that point now. So these are 
here is, um, these are the barrier nets, and there's just kilometres and kilometres that stop carp moving back into these sort of spawning habitat areas. Fike nets, fencing, trapping, traps in drains, electrofishing, poisoning. So all these things have gone on. Uh, gill netting, lots of gill netting. Lots of gill netting and more gill netting and more gill netting. Especially um, in Lake Sorrel in the latter part. One of the real key things in the carp program and one of the, the turning points was um, in planting male fish with radio transmitters. So the, these fish were, uh, the males were implanted with radio transmitters, put into the lake, allowed to mix with the general population in the lake, and then go, the guys went out um, and with their equipment and um, tracked these fish down. And, and out of that is, and I'm just throwing this one in for example, is these points where carp move through and aggregated. And it just happens to be a lot of this is sort of southwest and western shore, and these are the, the more protected shores and the shores where there are marshes, so a lot warmer water and marshlands. Cool. Um, this is netting happened in Lakes where I'll just put up this up as an example. Um, at one stage uh, in 1516, we had 215,100 net hours. So I, I think the daily the seven or eight days of net in, in one day. And Chris was just telling me that um, I think it must be this figure that basically if you stretch your nets, it would go from what Hobart to, to Sydney in that season. So that's, that gives you an idea of the, the amount of effort that it's taken. <coughs> I won't go through this one here too much, but basically to say this is like Crescent and Fishdown. These are numbers, year. There hasn't been a carp caught in Lake Crescent since 2009. And in Lake Sorrel, uh, you can see huge effort and the numbers falling away really quickly to the point where um, we're now down, or well, last, last summer, not this one, four carp. And this one, I think, was November. I put November anyway. We reckon this is the last one. And this is one of our stalwarts, Terry, as well. Terry's in his 70s now, and he's been there for ever and a day. So it's been you know, a huge, huge effort. Now I just want to move on to environmental issues. Um, here we have, on the left, um, Makatazi. And you can see here, this is um, the lowest 10% record. The record's for the lowest 10% of rainfall. So that was back in 2006, so that's that peak there. And then uh, this is the highest 10% of rainfall records. And so you can see basically these are driven by environmental issues, obviously low lake level. Um, way back here, 14 was really low turbidity, what we call NTU units, 14, 329, 250, and at the moment, the last month, back down to 18. Uh, we actually had some readings in Lake Crescent at 600. So this is the lake. Um, this is Lake Crescent at a low level, and this is all in marshland now. And it was pretty sort of desolate and, um, yeah, depressing. So as you can see, this is um, a survey we did back in 2021, and check this trout out. This guy. And even this is sort of one of the better ones. So you can see, once you lose that wetlands and the productivity, how basically the, the whole ecosystem just, just falls apart. And then to get it all back, you just add water. Simple, <laughs> simple, add water, yeah. Um, there's a guy from Tash Uni, uh, J.B. Kirkpatrick, and he said to journalists one day, he said, it's funny that fish need water, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's true, and add water, add ma and the marshlands <coughs> just come to life. This is the mar this is the mar Wow. Oh, anyway. Uh, yeah, cool. 
this is a marshland edge right out here. So it gives you an idea of where it's come back to. Um, so add water, productivity, and this is what you get for a trout fishery. These and these are not these are not these fish have not reached their growth potential yet. They've got another two or three years before they stop growing, putting on weight. These are results from a survey we did back in 2021. The blue dots, they tagged fish. So, so what we did, we went and got some fish from Great Lake in the spawning run, at the spawning run, tagged them, put them into Lake Crescent, did a population estimate, and, and during that, since that time, anglers have re returned um, some, some of the tag information and the growth on these fish. The smallest fish we put out was 260 grams. That's now 1.3 kilos. So that's in 20 months. This one here, uh, just over a kilo, now 3.8 kilo. And the biggest one we released back in uh, 2021 was 1.2 kilo, now 4.5. So they're pretty impressive growth rates. Um, yeah, so um, see the initial rate, uh, average weight was 800, 841 grams. Uh, so now it's like 2.5 kilo nearly. So that's a 95% increase in weight. And this is the result you get out of it. You know, kids catching fish, fantastic. And you know, I've brought Jeremy Wade over, so we could um, the guy that was running the car program at the time, so we Jonah, so we could teach him how to catch big tuna because Jonah can't catch big tuna. Um, yeah, and it's just fantastic stuff. So it's you know it's pretty simple stuff, you know, preserve wetlands, add water, and try and keep that water in the lake. And you know, it's just, it's, and it's resulted of all. So yeah, essentially that's it. Thank you. Right, thank Cheers. Taylor, uh, yeah, uh, there you are. Come on. Come on. Come on. Well, thanks everyone um, for, for coming. Um, I, uh, I worked in fisheries and hands for pretty much my whole career. And um, I've done a bunch of different things with a bunch of different um, people um, over that time. But um, I'm going to talk to you about my, my favourite stocking program today um, to deal with the uh, Eastern King prawn. Now, this, um, this program was, was hatched um, along with a, uh, a, a, at the Brisbane Casino. We um, had a conversation with one of the guys from our Wreck Fish Advisory Council and a Wreck Fisheries Manager from, from New South Wales. And um, pretty soon um, after that, we had a, uh, our first uh, grant for the program. And um, Faith, Faith Aguada came along for the ride, did a PhD on this work, um, as well as a, a couple of other people, um, people since. But um, I'll just start, start here with the, the recreational fishing licence. Um, so we got this in uh, at the turn of the century in, in New South Wales and um, really the idea behind this licence is all the fees going to a fund, a trust fund, um, and it's to be used for projects that are designed to improve recreational fishing opportunities. And so a number of things happen um, out of this fund, to name a, a few, you know, there's compliance officers, there's education work, there's, there's fisheries monitoring stuff, but three of the big ticket items that are funded out, out of this licence fund are, are, are Habitat, Repair and rehabilitation, uh, habitat enhancement, um, and, and fads, and um, and of course stocking. So, stocking is what I'm going to focus on today. Now, in New South Wales, uh, we went to, to quite a lot of effort some years ago to put together a marine fish um, stocking fisheries management strategy, which covered off on the risks and the strategies, strategies, um, and um, and, and uh, prioritisation for a number of different sort of high priority species. Um, but an important part of the, um, the strategy is, is that there was this, um, this idea that recruitment limited criteria should, should be considered 
um, with, with one exception, and that's in the case of research stocking, where you're doing releases to try and learn a bit more about the system and how it responds. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about, about Eastern King Prawn. Um, a little bit about Eastern King Prawn. So that, that's, that's a prawn, that's, that's a lobster-sized prawn there. So they get, they get quite large. Um, it's an estuarine oceanic prawn. Um, it's uh, harvested to the tune of 3,500 tonnes across the stock. The first point of sale, you know, some of the, the better prices are around $40 per kilo, so it's a, it's a high value product. You pay a lot, lot more than that at times um, retail. In New South Wales, we harvest about five to 600 tonne per year, um, all out of the uh, coastal trawl fishery, but it's also a recreational species. And I've just put this slide in here because um, I don't know how extensive recreational prawn fishing is, but it's certainly a thing in New South Wales. Um, and Victoria, um, I know there's a bit of it over in, in WA as well, but you know, basically what it involves is usually at night you, you wander around in the shallows with a dip net and a, uh, and a light um, and you scoop up prawns and you can do that from a boat as well. Uh, some of the more enthusiastic people that want bigger quantities can use a six metre drag net as well. Um, and it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great fun thing to do with, 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 with your family. So in New South Wales, um, about 110 tonnes per year uh, harvested across three main species, um, about 50 tonnes of those are, are Eastern King Prawn. Um, so most of the um, Eastern King Prawn recreational fishing occurs in this area here, south of, south of Sydney. Um, and that happens for a couple of reasons. So first of all, we've got a lot of these, um, these coastal lagoons. And these are great prawn habitats because they're nice and saline. The Eastern Kings uh, don't, don't like fresh water that, that much. Uh, but they're also shallow and they're easy for people to, to access for that, for that type of fishing, you know, wandering around the shores. And of course, as, as, as Rob just pointed out to us, habitat's really important. So they have a lot of the habitat in there that, um, that um, um, Eastern King Prawns um, need. Um, but I'll step back to this licence um, again, because one of the most important and significant things that was done with this licence very early on in the piece was the buyout of commercial fishing effort in uh, about 30 estuaries uh, uh, along the coast. And if you look at where they're distributed, you can see that a lot of those estuaries are actually uh, aligned with these estuaries that are, that are good eastern king prawn habitats. So um, th these actually provide really nice focal estuaries for fisheries enhancement because you don't you don't carry the externalities there. The, you know the wreck fishing funds will put um, you know prawns in the water, and then the commercials um, you know captured later, which, which causes a whole lot of lot of lot of, lot of issues to deal with. Um, but let's talk a bit about recruitment limitations. So Eastern King Prawn has a typical Panade biphasic um, type 2 life cycle. So it has an estuarine and oceanic phase. So the oceanic phase starts with a coastal nursery um, phase, is about, about three, three weeks or so. And then the prawns move out into the migratory and exploited stock. And this is where they're targeted by the, uh, the, the trawl fishery. And they really do, they, these lines here are actual tag prawns. They, they swim incredible distances. So some of these are originating here in Gibson Lakes, just to the, um, the east of us here. And they end up here off the spawning grounds um, up, up in the north of the country. So yeah, for a comparatively small animal, it's a big prawn, but it's, it's in the scheme of things, it's a small animal that's moving against the prevailing currents. It's quite a, quite a journey for the, for the animals to make. So they spawn up here um, off northern New South Wales and southeastern Queensland, and then they, their young reverse the journey. They drift back down in the, um, in the East Australian current. So they hit post larval stage, and then they recruit back into the uh, the estuaries to live out their their, their juvenile stage. Um, there's a couple of couple of things that contribute to recruitment limitation in Eastern King Prawn um, in the south of the state. And the, the first is really just the tyranny of distance there. So we've got the spawning spawning grounds up here. We've got the the, the estuarine nurseries down here. I mean there are nurseries all the way up along the coast, but I'm just concentrating on this part here. Um, the East Australian current can wreak havoc with the recruitment processes, so it does all sorts of funny things. Um, yeah, sometimes it'll send the, um, the spawned larvae out towards New Zealand um, and, and Lord Howe Island. Uh, sometimes it'll just keep them entrained in, in, in eddies here, um, and, and they don't get down to these um, to the inshore area so they can recruit in these estuaries here in, in the south. And what this creates um, is, 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 is a bit of a supply problem, where you, don't, you don't get the supply of larvae actually making it down there. But there's a Second part of this, this equation, um, in that a lot of these, these coastal estuaries here also have these sandy berms, they're called icoles, which is Australian terminology for intermittently closed opening landlocked lagoon. Uh, a bit of a mouthful, um, but yeah, basically what that means is a sandy berm. And for a, you know, a little post larvae swimming out here in the ocean, there's no way in the world it's going to be out access to nursery habitat in there. 
Um, you know, the other, there's a, there's, a, there's a lesser scenario here where uh, we have a constricted et entrance, which also contributes to the supply of, of larvae into the nursery. So um, the best place to see the effect of this on recruitment is to look at the old historic commercial catch from the South Coast estuaries. You can see just how wild and variable it is. So that's, that's the effect of those two things so kind of coming together year on year. Sometimes it's nothing, sometimes it's, it's 50 tonne. So the situation we've got is there's plenty of nursery habitat, expectant fishers and holiday makers that want to catch prawns, but variable, limited or no recruitment, which is the perfect formula for a bit of stocking, I think. Um, so just to summarise all this information, stocking generally occurs in estuaries that are in southern species range, generally close to the sea or have restricted entrances, have abundant juvenile habitat, and have shallow bathymetry for warm temperatures, which supports growth and productivity and ease of harvest. So we've done a bunch of research over the years to develop stocking strategies. We've looked at things like um, ecosystem productivity <coughs> rates, um, net ecosystem metabolism, alongside animal respiration, you know, trying to get to the harder questions like how many prawns should we put in a particular system. So we've got a quite a neat stocking model that we can use to look at different stocking scenarios and, um, and sort of uh, use that to frame what we do in any particular estuary and in any particular year and, and what we might get yielded out of a particular stocking event. But the stocking process is, is easy and hard at the same time. Um, so prawns um, tend to mate um, in, in periods coinciding with certain parts of the lunar cycle. And so what we find is a lot of females out there actually inseminated already, so they're carrying a spermatophore. Um, so what that means, it means is there's no broodstock management. All we need to do is we need to catch female prawns from the ocean trawl fishery off the north of the state, bring them into the hatchery and they can spawn. Then we can get rid of them when we want to stock again. You just go out and, 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 and get some more. It's a pan-mictic stock, so there's no stock structure there that, that, that we really need to worry about. Um, so once we get the, get the spawn, they're growing up um, as, as you do in Pinnate aquaculture in these uh, 40,000 parabol litre parabolic tanks to about um, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, millimetres total length, um, for, um, uh, which, is the, which is their post starval stage. And that's the stage that they move into the estuaries and, and settle out. Um, so once they're reared, we move them, um, move them down to the, the, the stocked estuaries. We ferry them out um, on boats you know, to, uh, across the key habitats um, that are important for their survival. We acclimate them to the water um, and then we release them. So fairly simple process. Uh, depending on the size of the estuary and its productivity, we're usually looking at releasing millions of post larva per estuary. Now, um, we've done a fairly intensive body of monitoring over the years. A lot of that involves citizen science and, and, and anglers out there that were measuring effort of other anglers as well as catching effort of, of themselves. Uh, a lot of independent survey work as well using a, a various uh, different approaches. Um, and we used, uh, to confirm that, that, that the ponds are actually ours, we, we developed some genetic techniques um, which we basically use maternally inherited markers. We only really caring about the females and we match that back to the broodstock that we used to um, use to spawn them. I'll just put in this, no presentation's complete without a good video. Um, this, is, this was taken by one of our rec fisheries managers um, some years ago in a stocked estuary just to show, show what it involves. You can see, you can see the prawn there is encouraging it into the, into the net. 100% um, certain that's a stock prawn because there's no recruitment in this particular estuary in that particular year and he's been wandering around for about half an hour you can see what he's got there these are these are really good sized prawns um, and uh, you know you, you'd be paying arm and a loop, loop for those in, in the shops you know, for very little effort you can go out to the estuary and, and catch these um, catch these yourselves so let's just um, look briefly at the post-release performance um, of, of the, the stock prawns um, we tend to stock in in December in any one year um, and that's to sort of, uh, we'll try to sort of match that to when recruitment tends to start in the species, but it also maximises the summer growth. And we find they recruit the fisher in 10 weeks, so there's a really, really tight window between when we put them in at, at that size and when they're, they're at that size and they're starting to get, get captured by the, um, by the fishers. Um, so fishing continues through the warmer months and things quieten down over winter. And then when spring comes, the growth recommences um, as well, and uh, we find that the, the bulk of the fishery coincides with those, um, those periods when the cohort biomass tends to, tends to peak out and, and the waters are, are warm. And what, what this looks like in, in terms of, of size, so after, after 10 weeks we're getting hand sized prawns. Um, they grow really, really fast in these systems. At the end of the first season, you know, we're getting prawns, prawns like that. Now you never see prawns like that 
in open estuaries because what happens is they run to sea. They want to get to sea and they want to migrate and they want to spawn. When they're trapped in the estuary, um, what are they going to do with the energy? They put it into somatic growth and so they get really big really, really quickly. Um, the upshot of that is so if the lake opens, they're all gone. <laughs> they hightail it out, out of there. Um, so just to, just to summarise, I started talk, talking about the use of licence funds to improve recreational fishing opportunities. I think this is a great example of, of how the licence funds are being used to do that. You know, it works, we've got a, it's a foundation, a science-based program. You know, anyone involved in fisheries enhancement knows how important it is to have recruitment limitation as a foundation for your manipulations. I think we've got a pretty clear case for that here. We get really fast recruitment to the fishery, I'm not sure if there's anything else out there that actually recruits the fishery that, that quickly after you stock it. And um, ultimately, our work's re-established fisheries and severely recruitment limited estuaries. Yeah, the extreme of that was one estuary that hadn't had a prawn in it for, for 12 years. Um, and it, 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 because of our work, it has a prawn fishery in it again. Um, the other thing I like about this is it's a, it's a, anyone can participate in this. You know, it's not like stocking a sport fish, you know, where you've got a very small proportion of anglers that are going to get any benefit out of the stocking. doesn't matter if you're five, or, you know, young Jasper Dar Hunter here, you caught that in an hour. Um, Faith will remember Jasper. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter if you're five or 85, you can get out, wander around the shallows for a bit of bit and, and catch yourself a feed of prawns. So if we look at numbers, you know, for, for an average cohort of about four million prawns, we can get up to nine tonnes coming through the wrecked fishery. And um, yeah, based on some assumptions I've made, yeah, that equates to about six dollars for every dollar invested in, in the actual stocking work. Now we've done a lot of work looking for environmental impacts, um, extensive monitoring, and in terms of the consumer communities, we haven't really been able to pick anything up there. Um, so in terms of future work, um, I uh, very close to my heart. I love crustaceans. Um, I work more with crustaceans than, than anything these days. Um, I'd love to develop um, similar programs for blue swimmer crab and, and mud crab. Um, they're in the FMS, so we can stock them. Um, we've developed a, a few rearing techniques for um, blue swimmer crab. Um, the West Australians have, have done, done, it, done it as well. Um, I've done over the last three or four years a lot of work looking at recruitment processes, so I can identify those recruitment limited niches um, in which to stock. But the, the sad news is that we keep getting this bloody white spot virus popping up. Um, which, is, which is wreaking havoc with, with the program. Um, it hinders post larval supply and it always cr also creates a whole lot, a lot of biosecurity con concerns. So um, a bit of a sort of a sad, sad point to end on for, for what is otherwise a, a positive program, but um, them's the breaks. And um, <laughs> that's it. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Recreational Fishing, Fishing Trust and, and all the people that have participated um, over the years. Sorry, Faith, you're an author. I don't know why you're here. So, <laughs> How do we get out of here? I don't know if I put my glasses on. Uh, I don't know how to get out of this goddamn talk. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, I got it. Took, took a moment. So don't, don't present my talk. No, no, it's right. I got it. Yeah, so yeah, move, move forward like this. Okay. Oh, hang on. No, you've, you've done something different here. You might need to get the yeah, AV guys. Um, I'll get the mind. I think I grab one of the other two guys. <laughs> one second. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs>
we're still stuck. Yeah. We're stuck. Uh, Uh, yeah, I do actually. Uh, uh, no, it's uh, it's um, in storage at the moment. Charles is you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sorry about that, folks. Um, uh, I'm going to talk on recreational fishing in the Murray-Darling Basin and would like to acknowledge my co-author, Ivor Stewart. The Murray-Darling Basin is over a million square kilometres covering southeastern Australia. Uh, the Murray-Darling Basin is the most regulated river system in the world. Native fish in the basin face unprecedented threats from climate change interacting with significant human modification of the basin. And these threats manifest themselves in a variety of ways, but most relate to changed hydrology and altered natural flow regimes of this river system with significant water extraction in the northern basin and reverse seasonal regulated flow in the southern basin. Some issues for recreational fishing in the Murray-Darling Basin include no basin scale overarching organisation to oversee re regulations. There's a lack of coordination on basin wide species. Climate change is looming as a major threatening process that may disrupt recreational fishing. And currently there is no action for restoring populations impacted by hypoxic events is stocking the answer. And how do we assess the future of recreational fishing in the Murray-Darling Basin? So I'm gonna look at some outcomes from population models developed for silver perch, listed as threatened. Golden perch, popular recreational fishing species and Murray Cod and iconic recreational fishing species. And then I'll draw together our understandings to provide a pathway forward for recreational fishing and sustainable native fish populations. Stochastic population models are useful for assigning scarce resources. We can assess if something is worth doing. If there are multiple options, then the options can be ranked based upon a variety of criteria and by including sources of chance variation, we're acknowledging that the system of interest is inherently uncertain and that there may be broad repeated patterns, but if we run the model multiple times, each outcome is slightly different. And we can assess knowledge gaps against any decision criteria. Would knowing more about something change the decision we make? So to construct a population model, we examine the life history of the species. This forms the underpinning logic of the population model. The biology provides the structure of the population model. The ecology identifies the relationships between the species and its environment and provides important context as to the drivers of population dynamics. We establish where flow and temperature influences the life history and identify any other impacts or threats and include these in the population model and we quantify these processes. We collect data where relevant to the life history and estimate survival and fecundity rates and assemble all of this information in a mathematical framework. Silver perch life history reveals they are long lived, fast growing, have variable fecundity, females sexually mature at four years of age, exhibit large scale movement, are a flow dependent spawner, have egg and larval drift as part of their life cycle and both juveniles and adults move. So we developed a metal population model for silver perch in the Murray-Darling Basin, where we defined 14 connected populations with flow and temperature providing spawning cues at each location with egg and larval drift, juvenile and adult movement driven by flow. We look at output for the whole Murray-Darling Basin as well as the southern Murray-Darling Basin and the northern Murray-Darling Basin. We did not include impoundments in our model and consequently silver perch were stocked in seven rivers in our model of the basin. Of these seven rivers, three were in the northern basin in yellow and four in the southern basin in blue. Here there are trajectories from 1,000 iterations of the silver perch metal population model we're stocking. We see that dynamics vary through time in response to the 36 year flow and temperature time series. And we can see that population increases in the 80s and 90s and then declines through the millennium drought. The black line is the mean trajectory, blue lines are plus or minus one standard deviation and red lines is minimum and maximum. Very similar pattern for the southern Murray-Darling Basin. And why is this? Because the silver perch population in the, northern Murray Basin, in the northern basin is predicted to have declined significantly. 
The forecast population decline is supported by field sampling where very few silver perch are found in rivers and little evidence that spawning or recruitment occurs. Silver perch can be considered functionally extinct in the rivers of the Northern Basin and to examine options of silver perch, I'll present output on the mean trajectories. So this is the mean trajectory with no stocking. There's virtually no difference when historical stocking is added. So we asked ourselves, can we restore silver perch populations by modifying the historical stocking regime? What if we increase the historical regime by a factor of 10? Not much difference. A factor of 100? We can see a small response. With a factor of 1,000 times the historical stocking regime, we can see that the decline in silver perch population has halted with a relatively substantial population established. The historical stocking regime has no benefit for silver perch in the Northern Basin rivers and requires significant ramp up of effort for recovery to be delisted and open to wreck fishing again. Do we have the capacity to do this? Now to look at golden perch, an important recreational fishing species in the Murray-Darling Basin. Golden perch are long-lived, fast-growing, have variable fecundity, female sexually mature by four years of age, exhibit large-scale movement, flow-dependent spawner, egg and larval drift are part of their life cycle, and both juveniles and adult move. So here's a construct for golden perch in the southern Murray-Darling Basin with flow and temperature used to define spawning, egg and larval drift, juvenile and adult movement. We use a model flow and temperature data set from 1896 to 2019 to examine golden perch population dynamics. And we can see the population dynamics respond to flow and temp with recognised patterns from known events such as the 1956 flood uh, producing a peak in adults in 1960, the wet decades of the mid 70s to 80s, the flood in the 90s and declines during the millennium drought. Commercial fishing began in 56, and we've included recreational fishing from 1956 onwards with a 5% chance of being caught and kept for golden perch greater than 30 centimetres. I'm going to focus on 1956 onward, presenting on mean trajectories. So here's the mean trajectory of this scenario with commercial fishing and recreational fishing and no stocking. This is the same scenario with recreational fishing removed, and we can see how recreational fishing changes population trajectories can we use stocking to account for recreational fishing impacts and approach scenario two trajectory? So stocking 200,000 golden perch in each population, a total of 1.4 million fish makes a marginal difference. The outcome when stocking 1 million fish in each population, stocking 2 million fish in each population, stocking 4 million fish in each population every year from 1956 achieves close enough to parity with, with scenario two. We can calculate the expected mean of all 1,000 trajectories and compare the different scenarios. The percentages relate to the change from scenario one. We can see that scenario six is very similar to scenario two, indicating that scenario six achieves the goal of accounting for recreational fishing effects on population trajectories. And you can see other scenario contributions. Stocking can produce benefits, but spatial scale of populations is rarely considered by coordinated management and required effort to account for recreational fishing may be substantial. Moreover, an example of spatial scale, if we're only to manage for one population, for example P3, then we might consider scenario 5 sufficient, yet to account for recreational fishing, scenario 6 is required at the basin scale. Now onto Murray Cod, which are long-lived, have variable fecundity, female sexually mature by five years of age, greater 1.4 metres in length, with a fishery slot 55 centimetres, 75 centimetres. They exhibit strong site fidelity, prefer flowing habitats of spawning, and are highly vulnerable to hypoxic events. Mullaroo Creek is a small flowing anabranch system approximately 20 kilometres in length and is an important breeding population in the lower section of the Murray River where little breeding occurs due to large weir pools. We model fishing with a 10% probability of being caught and kept in the slot and a background of two hypoxic events in 2010 and 2016. A micro capture study conducted during 2016 event was used to quantify the hypoxic impact on Murray Cod to estimate population recovery. We repeated the flow and temperature time series from 1980 to 2009 and added this after 2021. We see the following, uh, that following the 2016 hypoxic event that there is slow recovery. 
For the rest of the present, uh, presented outputs, I'll focus on results from the 2000 onwards uh, using the mean trajectory. Here's the mean trajectory of fishing. Can we recover the population to its pre-hypoxic event state using stocking? Here's a trajectory when we add 25,000 Murray cod for 10 years from 2016. Stocking 50,000 Murray cod. 100,000 Murray cod stocked for 10 years returns the population to its pre-hypoxic event state. Are there other options? Fishing closure for 10 years post-2016 provides steady but slow recovery. Fishing closure for 10 years plus 25,000 stocked Murray cod provides recovery to the pre-hypoxic event state, though slower than scenario two. Hypoxic events generally occur at a basin scale and therefore numerous populations may be impacted and the stocking required by multiples of this example. Uh, depending on resources available on the scale of hypoxic events, integrated solutions may be required, including closures, to protect important breeding populations. We can calculate the expected mean from 2016 onwards. This indicates that scenario six is almost equivalent to scenario four, but at a quarter of the cost. So some conclusions. Um, a significant investment is required to delist silver perch as a threatened species and make them available for recreational harvest. With this modelling, it is possible to determine if complementary measures such as restoring lodic permanent flows will recover silver perch populations in the Northern Basin and the mix of stocking that aids in recovery. Recreational take restructures native fish populations and alters population trajectories. Stocking alone may not support populations of highly valued recreational species such as golden perch if the aim is to restore native fish populations to a greater level than they currently are in the basin, particularly with lower potential inflows due to climate change. Current hatchery production is not sufficient to improve populations at a basin scale. We can examine other investments, e.g. environmental flows, and compare them to stocking and undertake a cost-benefit analysis. Climate change forecasts are for more intense extremes, longer droughts, larger floods. Murray cod populations are highly vulnerable to effects of both high flow hypoxia, black water events, and low flow hypoxia, low dissolved oxygen in pools. Hypoxic events may occur more frequently and at large scale. Stocking can reach recovery, uh, help reach recovery at the, uh, the resources available for basin recovery. Complementary measures, e.g. permanent lodic flows, may be required for important populations. Population models are a useful tool for examining complex real-world scenarios of wreck fishing and flow management options, including climate change. The necessary tools are developed to inform management about allocation of resources, easy to include a variety of options, and we can undertake cost-benefit analysis of alternative management actions and prioritisation of funding and resources. Management should be using these tools to develop proactive strategies for native fish populations. For the future of wreck fishing, the Murray-Darling Basin is important to work together to test scenarios with existing ecology-based population models. Stocking is, is useful in local applications, e.g. Uh, trout cod reintroduction in the Ovens River and supporting Murray cod in the Mitamita River but not an answer for basin-wide recovery unless capacity is significantly increased. If we want strong wreck fisheries, then the answer is integrated interventions for basin-scale recovery, a coordinated basin-scale management for golden perch, anyone? Thank you. I'm there. Go? Yes, please. All right. Thank you all for coming.
If you've seen my other talks, this is something of a change. I've been getting a reputation of uh, being a guy who works with app data. This is kind of a story of a failed app study. Um, I can tell you, if you're uh, over a drink sometime, how, how that kind of went down. Um, and so this is some other data we were able to analyze as uh, through this project. Um, and I wouldn't say failed study, but uh, a little bit more effort required than we, um, than we anticipated. Uh, the system was a little, little bit challenging. Um, a key takeaway from this, um, uh, this talk is going to be the importance of education and enforcement uh, with respect to um, rockfish conservation areas, and I would say conservation areas in general. A uh, show of hands if you are uh, familiar with uh, Canada's uh, west coast, southwest coast, Vancouver, um, Victoria, if you've visited. Wonderful. If you've been there, you know it's absolutely beautiful. So I've got some images sort of blurred in the background to give you that, that sense of, of the beauty of that area. It's also beauty, uh, beautiful under the water and includes a lot of important um, uh, rockfish species that are inland and unfortunately they are um, uh, of conservation concern, largely due to fishing mortality. Um, they're not always a target species, but uh, because of their depth, they suffer from barotrauma. They have what's considered a slow life history and because of that barrel trauma, they have high release mortality associated with them. So in um, early 2000s, mid 2000s, established uh, roughly 200 rockfish conservation areas to try to address this concern. Uh, and in these areas, fishing was prohibited. And, and I don't think this map shows all of the areas. I think they continue further north, but this is the, uh, the bulk of them. A paper was studied in 2016 that I want to introduce you to and, and kind of go over the, the main results of that study, although I think the title kind of says it all, um, that this, there's a compliance issue within this system, at least when that paper was published. This paper focused on a roughly a triangular area, approximately uh, involving 77 of those rockfish areas. They had data from uh, uh, showing fishing from aerial creel, creel surveys in 2000, so before these areas were established, and they were visiting them in 2007 and 2011 to look at uh, compliance. Uh, and there was a compliance issue. So just those main findings, low or no fishing effort in 44% of them, so that's good, but effort was medium to high, and over that time frame stayed high or increased in, in roughly half of the rockfish conservation areas and decreased in just 11% of them. Compliance was um, lowest in, in, uh, for, sorry, for large RCAs that were in uh, popular fishing areas with low enforcement, um, likely resulting in the mortality of thousands of rockfish per year. And this is a direct quote from the paper. Um, emphasizing the importance of uh, to education and enforcement. Uh, just to drive that point home, um, there's a, a, an area where they were able to do some so fairly localized surveys and just showing that kind of lack of awareness of these, uh, of these areas. I think it's encouraging, though, that uh, uh, when there is noncompliance, it was not uh, really intentional. In most cases, at least this is what the survey respondents were saying, is that it was, it was unintentional. They didn't know that the RCAs, these conservation areas, existed or knew where they were. Um, some of them believe that, yes, I can avoid fishing for rockfish in them, but it's okay to fish for salmon. And really, this is full closure. Um, so uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, education and enforcement uh, campaign as a result of this evidence that um, it's not just, you can't just create these protected areas. People need to know about them. And you need carrots and sticks. And so uh, what we're doing is upgrading that, um, that paper by analyzing data and with two main questions. Has compliance improved as a result of education enforcement and what happened during COVID as well? So we have data from 2019 to 2020 and begin by focusing on uh, how things looked between um, um, 2011 and 2019. So that 2016 paper, that the last data they had were from 2011. So uh, first I want to focus on the gray areas. These are buffer areas within one kilometer of those conservation areas. And you can see that in general there's really no change in fishing. 
um, over that uh, eight-year time frame, but a dramatic, dramatic reduction in fishing as a result of enforcement education. So this is a, a real win. Um, um, and it's overall uh, much better compliance as a result of, of that education and enforcement. This is an example of one of the signs they had at the conservation area and near a boat launch so that people are aware that these exist. Um, compliance did remain high, though. You can see that here in some of these outliers in 2019. And if you look at those areas, um, it's typically in RCAs that are associated with um, uh, non-local or tourist fishing, um, which really plays into that lack of awareness and not knowing where these are and not really knowing the rules and just wanting to go out and fish. Um, 2020 to 2021 includes the impacts of COVID. And we see a typical pattern of uh, fishing both inside and outside of these rockfish conservation areas, that typical COVID pattern where everyone was out fishing in 2020 and then it, it, it was starting to decline in 2021. So we see that in both cases. So this is a reference in 2011 and 2019, so up and down, up and down there as well. Uh, effort increased in 23% of the, those rockfish conservation areas and, and decreased in just 6% of them. Um, this is a time when there was very low enforcement. The, uh, the education was still there, but not as much. The, um, the uh, NGOs that do some of this education, that face-to-face, -face, uh, they were not able to operate. Um, they were only able to do things remotely and through email, et cetera, just due to you know, not being able to uh, interact and, and maintain social distancing and everything like that. And so. Um, a little bit of a, of a free-for-all. Um, it's interesting to look at where the effort seems to be increasing, where it seems to be de decreasing. Um, the declines were mostly in those tourist areas, which makes sense if you know, tourism was shut down. And, and so it looks like the non-compliance was largely near population centers as a result of, result of local fishing. Um, pure speculation as to whether that was an intentional uh, or not. Certainly is consistent with um, um, efforts to get people fishing locally. This is not from Brit British Columbia, but this is from uh, New Jersey, but a very common um, effort there to get people uh, outside and fishing during the pandemic, but staying local. Certainly consistent with the emerging, emerging literature showing a reduction in enforcement and mon monitoring in those areas, um, increases in poaching, perhaps for food subsistence, uh, general increase in people misbehaving. So there's other papers of people just breaking laws and, and whatever, not necessarily poaching, but certainly doing bad things or misbehaving slightly, uh, right? No one's watching, right? Um, so Jane, Mentor, uh, main conclusions here, um, high rates of compliance are possible, um, but they're unlikely in the absence of education and enforcement. You can't just, just put these conservation areas in place and expect people to do the right thing. They need to be reminded and educated. Um, uh, high resolution data are essential for, for prioritizing education and enforcement. So this isn't a one size fits all for all of these conservation areas. There's you know 200 of them. Some need more attention than others. So during rare events, for example, like a pandemic, perhaps fo focus education and enforcement near population cent centers. Um, so that's more of a local story. Uh, in, in what we would consider to be normal years, um, you can shore up issues, at least within this system, where uh, they're in, in areas where there is a lot of tourist fishing and, and start to message. So they, the, the tourists might be falling through that gap, um, perhaps. Um, the pandemic certainly sucked, and it's, it's still happening. Um, but there's a silver lining in, in a lot of this in that it's a really large natural experiment that really allowed us to, to gain insight into this system in many systems. Um, so that is, is certainly a benefit. Uh, so with that, I say thank you uh, very much. Um, acknowledge my co-authors uh, who are on that title slide. We have uh, funding to, to recognize as well. Help from uh, people within the lab and, and elsewhere and um, travel support from, from the, uh, the conference. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, good to see you all here. I see Matt Landos here and I'm going to make some comments today about microbiology, so go easy on me mate, I may not get it all right, but we'll do what we can. Um, I'm just going to provide a story today rather than a research topic, uh, which is about how we developed some reservoir fisheries in southern Australia and do a case study in South Australia, which uh, we always tell people is the driest state in the driest continent in the world. So when we talk about freshwater systems in, uh, in South Australia in particular, we feel very sensitive uh, in comparison to some of the uh, North American freshwater systems we've got. So why is reservoir fishing so important? Well, again, going back to that analogy of the driest state and driest continent, we just don't have anywhere to fish when it comes to freshwater. Uh, we have one major river system, which is used very heavily for all sorts of things. And so reservoirs are one of these uh, venues where we've tried to get access over many years and eventually got to it. And people really like going to reservoirs because they're safe and they're accessible and they're pretty nice places as well. Um, most of them are in the vicinity of the metropolitan zone of Adelaide, the larger ones, but there are some remote ones that we'll touch on as well. Um, these experiences are based on working with a few different water authorities or water companies, whichever one you want to call them. Uh, water New South Wales, which has a very large portfolio and, and manages the bulk water supplies to Sydney. Coldham Water, which is more of a rural uh, water supply, but for potable water to Bendigo, etc. And SO Water, which is the uh, sole water manager, uh, bulk water supplier in South Australia, all working under the Australian Water Quality Guidelines which define what uh, sort of standard of water gets to the tap, but also has some really interesting stuff around the threat uh, process, uh, sorry, the threat assessment process you need to go through in order to determine what level of water treatment you need to have for your supplies. Now, as I say, these are guidelines. They get ranked and, they, and that helps you determine, as I say, the level of treatment, but, you know, sometimes we see anomalies in that. Um, there's a couple of others as well we've worked with, which is uh, Grandpa, Grampian Wimmera Mallee Water and Golden Murray Water, who are predominantly um, irrigation supplies, so they do have some uh, potable water supply remit. They actually have recreational management within their legislation, and they're really good to build. So oh, the other ones are not that bad, but you, know, you get my point. Um, so dealing with water companies, I, some of these are private companies, but, uh, well, sorry, uh, commercialised companies. Um, they have a culture which is around water supply. It's not about recreational management. Their core business is water supply. Their capability is around engineering and delivery. And they're profit-making organisations. Even companies such as SA Water provide a lot of money back to the South Australian State Government for other essential services. They have vast estates of land uh, and need to deal with issues such as bushfire, vegetation management, erosion. Um, visitor management is often a, a bit of a foreign thing to them. Um, it's not seen as something that they really want to do, um, but uh, accepting that over time they're going to have to. And water quality is, the, is number one uh, kid on the block for them. And most of these other things through here, oops, are about managing for improving water quality or maintaining water quality. We're going to focus a little bit on the disease aspects of uh, water supply because these are the things are quite manageable. If, you're a, if you manage a national park, and there's many, many national parks, you're dealing with these things anyway. The technology, the know-how, etc., the recipe is there. Um, but, and so, we almost move past them in a sense when, we, when we, we have the negotiations and this disease aspect becomes the one that actually dominates the conversation. So, a little bit about how water, water, uh, water quality is protected. The, the Australian Water Quality Guidelines provide a um, multi-barrier approach or suggest a multi-barrier approach to protecting water quality from the catchment to the tap. The dotted line represents really what's within the control of the water company. Outside and in most Australian uh, uh, situations, the catchments are open or semi-open. There's a few closed catchments. So what that means essentially is that there's a whole bunch of things happening in the catchment which have an impact on water quality. <clears throat> 
going on to disease, the number one conversation we had was around a um, waterborne parasite called Cryptosporidium. And we never ever talk about Giardia because it's too scary, but Cryptosporidium is a waterborne parasite occurring naturally in waterways. And the, the big concern, and it causes, sorry, it causes really intense gastrointestinal disease, diarrhea, vomiting, death as well. And so this is when you hear about bad water quality, yes, there's colour and so on and so forth, but this is the one that is considered the greatest a threat when considering human access to reservoirs. And that's just pointing out there, humans can also infect the reservoir and the process that, the, that they do it by is what they call fecal shedding. So um, people getting into the water who have uh, cryptosporidiosis and shed into the water can cause infection. So the, the concern very much is about allowing people into the water, um, but people are demanding to go into the water, particularly people kayaking, and there's a demand for other types of activities as well. The dilemma, of course, is that many animals carry cryptosporidium in their systems, and they exist in the catchment. And you take many catchments, there are extensive agricultural areas, there's pets, there's natural, natural wildlife, and there's people living in these catchments. Um, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people living in the catchments. So it, it sort of, it really places the water authorities in a, in a somewhat compromised position because whilst they want to stop humans getting into the reservoirs, we've still got these natural vectors and uh, reservoirs be becoming infected anyway. And from the catchment to the reservoir. So beyond here are the issues, but we'll get onto them right now. So cryptosporidium, if it's getting in there anyway and it causes so many problems, are we being compromised into the water that we're getting delivered to us? Well, we don't have to be, and that's the point. So UV treatment kills cryptosporidium. So that's a great thing. We can put UV on our, in our water treatment plants. Problem is, they cost a lot of money, and therefore there's few UV facilities on our water supplies in Australia. Now, how do you, how do you deal with that? You say, okay, our health is being compromised by the lack of these facilities. Even if wrecked fishes aren't in reservoirs or swimming, we still have this threat. And there's a really big sort of model around threat and risk management that I can't go into and uh, which, uh, yeah, I can't even actually interpret sometimes. And it's the domain of the microbiologist. Matt could probably help us somewhere along the line there, mate. Um, so, when it comes to having a negotiation with the Ward Authority around accessing reservoirs, it revolves around, well, put UV on and it's all sold, and the answer is, well, there's not enough money to do that. And the, the response is, well, you're putting my health at, at risk, and you can two, kill, uh, kill two birds with one stone by investing. Now, just to give you a perspective of the culture, I, I guess, is that we started negotiating access to uh, the Sydney Water Reservoirs uh, about five or seven years ago. And the thoughts were that a UV plant on Prospect Reservoir, which is in Western Sydney, could provide a number of opportunities through that catchment. And of course there was resistance and they said, look, it's $30 million for us to do that. And then a year later it was $100 million to do it. And then two years later it was $500 million to dollars to do it. Now it's 1.2 billion to put a water uh, uh, UV plant on. Now UV technology is not that complicated. So uh, I'm just going, what I'm pointing out is we're still going back to that culture of core business, profit driven. The reservoir aspect of the multi-barrier approach actually provides some, some uh, barriers within barriers, but they also provide some recreational fishing opportunity. This is in South Australia. Um, this is a wet reservoir network called the South Power uh, Network, if you like. And it has three reservoirs in it. And this arrangement, which is quite typical, does provide opportunity because of the diminished risk of cryptosporidium in the water supply. So what you have 
Because Warren Reservoir, which used to be part of the potable water supply system, highest in the catchment, now used for irrigation water. Fishing is allowed in there now. We managed to get that through in 2016. South Parra is a large storage reservoir. So a storage reservoir is something that stores water but is not connected to a uh, supply. And fishing is allowed in there. And if you really want to experience some good fishing, go there at the moment. It's great. See Alex and Luke. And then lastly, we have Barossa. Now, this, is, this isn't part of the, the catchment. It's discrete from the catchment. And water is actually piped from there to Barossa. And it has a water treatment plant on it. And because it has no UV, fishing is not allowed in there at the moment. Now, that seems fairly logical. Uh, however, there's some anomalies coming up. If you've got systems like this, where water treatment plants are on a, on a reservoir somewhere, and you've got storage facilities, the thinking is that there's some, some distance, because there's some distance or some sort of um, disconnect, if you like, between storage reservoirs and uh, supply reservoirs, is that fishing can occur on water and land-based fishing can occur and kayaking can occur. And SO Water have accepted this to the point now that this is a very important part of their portfolio. So I'm moving into a case study now on SO Water. And Wreckfish SA, who are the peak community body in South Australia, fishing body. And this is a little bit about the history. So in World War II, the reservoirs were quite down because apparently the Germans were gonna contaminate the reservoirs in South Australia. Um, eventually, in 1996, through some political manoeuvring, um, they opened South Parra Reservoir to fishing. And I just happened to join SA Water at the time as their catchment manager, and the instruction was, make sure this doesn't work because we don't do this. Uh, and they did, it was effective, you know, it, it didn't really work. Um, there was 500 people there on opening day and like three the next day. There was bad access, there was no stocking, and it was quite a disaster from a fishing perspective, but it suited their need. Now they moved from there uh, to Warren. They said, we're transferring now because we need to do some work on the uh, spillway in here. And Warren is that really accessible reservoir. It's got the road running alongside of it. They didn't promote it, no stocking or anything, but it actually was the beachhead in many ways because people were using it more often. There was no real negative impact going on. There's been no evidence of water quality degradation over these times. And what that actually provided us was evidence that wreck fishing could co-occur with water supply. So the government in 2014, as an offset to putting in marine parts, said we're going to open four reservoirs for you. So the four that they nominated are all offline or non-supply reservoirs, redundant, decommissioned, call, you what the, call them what you will. And then it happened, you know. It was, it was just an incredible period between 2016 and 19. They were opened, they provided a grant scheme. We stopped these uh, uh, reservoirs with Murray Darwin Nason species, cod, silver perch, and golden perch. We were given management rights for many things, and uh, things were wonderful, and we thought there was other opportunities. Unfortunately, the government changed, and there was some political argy bargy, and wreckfish lost its traction basically de defunded. But that government was committed to open reservoirs as well. But they took another step, which talked about opening supply reservoirs. And that was really quite a profound uh, point that policy they were making. Government's changed back again, and Rekfish SA are now back in the mix, though under a different management regime. So this is basically what's happened. The initial reservoirs opened with these three non-commissioned reservoirs. The two up here are up near Port Pirie, if anyone knows it. Uh, Flinders Ranges, stopped, small, um, but wonderful nonetheless. Two of them fished really well. The other one's almost inaccessible. The fourth of those is this one, um, which was stopped and probably the best of the lot, but unfortunately there were some land management issues around there. It's never been opened since. And then we had an approach from National Parks to uh, develop a fishery up in uh, the Northern Flinders, the Aruna Dam near Lee Creek, which is like an outback fishery. It's something very, very unique and uh, really showing good signs. 
And then, whoops, the new government came in in 2019 and opened two direct water supply reservoirs, which was like, wow, this is incredible. How are you going to do this? And they're like, well, just telling us our water, it's going to happen. So, okay. Um, UV's been put on both of them. But the government's never been overt about that because of the cost involved. This was in the electorate of the water minister at the time, and this was in a marginal seat. Good thing is, they stopped this one with 6,000 Murray cod between sort of 40 and 50 centimetres. Instant, wow. instant fishery. Instant wow. fishery. Yeah. Yeah. And people who don't even know what a Murray cod were catching them. It caused problems with handling and so on and so forth. But he retained his seat, so it was good for him. <laughs> <laughs> this was stopped with Murray cod, golden perch, silvers, I can't recall. And we thought there were some trout somewhere, uh, but not too sure on what happened there because we've been precluded from it. But the fishing community has benefited immensely from these. So we have this network of reservoirs now. In terms of size, you know, they're mud puddles compared to other places. But they're all we got, and they actually provide some fantastic fishing for people that really pursue them. So going on a little bit on to what management was, this is how it started when the Water Authority didn't really want much to do with this. This is the Water Authority uh, responsibility, compliance, regulation and state management. They said you can do everything else. Licensing. We were given the permitting scheme and we ran the permitting scheme and the money generated came to us, which is like, how has the government ever done that before? But it did. We paid for the stocking out of this, we promoted, we put habitat in, and we did many things around stewardship, which was included things like um, clean-up days, you know, kids' fishing clinics, so on and so forth. In 2023, we got, we got to this point. And you can see the blues growing immensely as a result of that change in government. The yellow is sort of in there. But we lost the permit scheme. The money's kept by government now. They do the stocking with a little bit of sort of consultation. Um, They've implemented a research program, I'll show a couple of results on that in a little more, which is great, uh, and taken control in many areas. Habitat and stewardship and promotion is probably where the recreational sector as a whole has more influence now. Interesting point about both of these things is that we consider they're both sustainable fisheries. Okay, the fisheries were growing, people were really enjoying them and getting behind them. Stocking was occurring to the level that was necessary. And so it's hard to say, you know, what's best because it both resulted in something very good. For me, at the end of the day, probably somewhere in the middle is where it might land, but that's a personal aspiration. So what's been achieved? I'm going to flick through this, and it's just a series of pictures. We planned it out for all reservoirs. This is a runa up in the Flinders, unbelievable spot if you're travelling around. Uh, we've been putting habitat into Warren and South Power. Business, you know, little Johnny's got his live fat fishing worms. So if you're going up that way, buy some fat fishing worms. We've got lure makers that are in, in the area. We've got one in the room here. Uh, media, you know, there's a lot of social media about these things. Uh, the research program, you see the Saudi crew in the back there. And some great fishing opportunities for introduced species, but some of the non-native uh, species up there. And what else we got? The vents and some stocking and some citizen science programs tied in for the research. So a lot going on uh, with not a lot of resources, but the dedication of, I'm going to point them out, these two guys here, Luke and Alex, and, uh, legends. And, uh, um, <laughs> and uh, what they've actually delivered to the people is wonderful. It really is. So that's pretty much the story on the development. I'm just going to, for the biologists around, I'm just going to provide some information on the stocking program. One of the beauties of this system is that these systems had no native fish in them previously in terms of large, large body species. They were stocked with cod, kelp and silvers for the first time in 2016. 
And they're the stocking numbers. These things are only 100 hectares in size, so the numbers are not huge. I point out Warren, which had like 26,000 golden perch and silver perch and quite a few Murray cod, and show you what we've actually found. So this data is from November. An intensive survey by Saudi Aquatic Sciences came up with these numbers. And it shows that over that seven year period, golden perch, 7.8, sorry, 7.35% have survived. Now that's not only surviving through the first difficult year, that's surviving extraction by recreational fishers as well. We don't think there's a huge amount of that because we've worked very hard on catching the waves, but there is a bag, people can still take two fish. It comprises 19% of the biomass of this fishery, a fishery that was dominated by redfin. Okay, so you know, the story about never stocking a redfin nest, um, it has got strength to it, but in this case, we've seen some great results. So there was always this rule of thumb about 10% survival to when, you know, is that true? This is the truth now, as far as we know. But what's golden perch? We've seen some pictures from Charles, which is great. Wanted to just show you one. Uh, and why people love it so much. It's this staunch Murray Darling Basin native. It's the little Aussie battler for our international guests. Hits lures hard, pulls hard, tastes pretty good if you want to get one. Impressive fish all round. And that's it. That going? Yep, that's on. That's right. Okay. Got a question for you, Charles. You threw around a couple of numbers there about sort of ten percent cod getting extracted. I think had five percent GPs on those models. Where'd those numbers come from? Are they sort of are they conservative estimates? So are they high balls? Or are they based on data? I mean, it's quite hard to get those numbers, I suppose. Uh, so. estimates on Murray Cod take in the slot were around 30%. So 10% was an underestimate. Uh, golden perch um, I think is an underestimate. But I mean, in, in some the model is a bit dumb with regard to that probability. It's just applied uniformly. When pop populations increase, the take might be more. When populations decrease, the take might be less. And so the probability of being caught would probably be dynamic and not at a set level. So I've assumed a conservative rate, but it's not necessarily a smart model. Yeah, I'm not sure if this would work. Thank you very much. Um, Danny, uh, stocking on grown fish versus fingerlings. Well, I mean, at the time that we stopped, we didn't have enough money to do on growers in any substantial numbers. Uh, we were coming from basically a zero base. So our strategy was crash stocking, putting as many as we could afford into a, a redfin haven. Uh, and we feel it's worked. But it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, the political outcome that the, that gentleman was seeking. Spent a lot of money on achieving that, but. It, Anglers are very, very happy. So I, I think it's all about the outcome. And I think in South Para, for instance, next door, a lot larger, 
requires a lot of fish to make it fishable, and I think the crash stocking uh, approach is the way to go there. But again, you know, if you're looking for an urban put and take fishery or a small family fishery, perhaps the on grounds is the way to go. Horses for horses. Yeah. I've got a question, John. Oh, sorry. I've got a question for Matt. I don't think I need the mic. Sure. Thank you. Um, Matt, what are, what are your stocked prawns eating in these closed fisheries? What's sustaining them through growth, putting on that massive biomass? Well, I think it's just principally primary consumers. Um, you know, the things that eat the, the plants in the air. And so what, what kind of impact is that in those systems in terms of, um, you know, is it... Competing out, competing other species, or well, we, we we have we have looked for that, and so what what we did is we we used uh, uh, stable isotope traces to look at changes in niche breadth. Um, we couldn't find anything really conclusive there, which showed, and then that was structured years before, sort of after after type type examination with some reference estuaries, and we also looked at the abundance of the consumer communities that they'd be competing with, and similarly, you had a lot of sampling. I think what six, seven thousand samples in that study, Becca. Yep, and um, still, yeah, still no detectable change. So yeah, we thought that it'd be harder to detect the change, which is why we put in so much effort effort for sampling, but. Yep. So, and I think it comes down to the, the stocking model where we've been quite careful to sort of model the productivity in the system. We assign a portion of that productivity to support the stock cohort um, and so sort of keep things in, in check that way. Uh, Charles, have you run your model forward um, a further four years? after the most recent floods to uh, predict what kind of populations that we should be predicting to see? I'm not sure what kind of dynamics might occur. So the answer, simple answer is no, I don't have data at this point. Um, I, I um, spent most of the last week just running these simulations, so this is kind of hot off the press. Um, so I haven't got any of the latest information to put into these models at this point. Um, I, you know, I look forward to doing that uh, in the near future. Give it a Rob, um, so when you drop the water level down, obviously it's good to get rid of the carp, you're exposing, you're killing the aquatic vegetation. If you bring it up too quickly, you'll get a whole lot of turbidity. How did you manage that water level fluctuations to make sure that you didn't just get a massive turbid state that you could get none of this um, aquatic vegetation going, which is needed for productivity? Yeah, thanks. It's a, a question for Paul. Um, I'm I'm from BC as 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 well, and uh, I'm quite uh, glad to see the work and efforts that d that you're um, looking at. Uh, you know, seeing how those RCAs are being used or not, and uh, also it's interesting to know sort of the effectiveness of the RCAs, which is sort of a related discussion but different. That I realize what you're up to. A question though for you, Paul, is I, I'm curious to know how how sort of the uh, the effort and um, um, the the anglers that were in these areas w was determined. Was it just through the creel, or was it uh, uh, angler reported, or sort of a combination of those things, or not? And part of the reason why I ask that is because you actually touched on it in your presentation, is that there are uh, First Nations that uh, that. Can can fish in those areas, and quite often they're in the similar kinds of boats that, uh, or 
ordinarily uh, non-Indigenous um, recreational anglers would be in as well. And so I just wondered, one, how you uh, kind of address that challenge or how that was uh, determined, because it's, it's tricky, uh, yeah. understandably. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was strictly flyover for reels. So that's, that's, that's should I have the microphone? Yeah, it was strictly flyover. So um, those are just observations. And um, there it, there's, can be some confounding with that, uh, certainly with the, with the native fishery. Um, we've been approaching them um, and trying to get if they have any information on, on when and where fishing was occurring. And the records either um, are not available or, or they don't want them to be available, which I understand. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's those observations. And, and apparently they get close enough that they can see fishing lines and that's, you know, that's kind of the rule apparently they use. If they see someone actually fishing, then it counts. Um, and so traditional fishing can involve that, but it could also be you know, pots and, and nets and things as well. So it, it, if they are fishing, it's a native fishery with rods, then it would be picked up. So there's probably some of that going on. Yeah, one for Danny. Um, New South Wales, with the election coming up, you would have seen Labor pledge potentially to open up Prospect Reservoir uh, for swimming. What are your thoughts on that for fishing access with regard to their treatment in there? Well, um, as I say, Prospect uh, is really the hub of water supply to Western Sydney. And actually, I think they, they've talked about potentially up to 70% of the water that comes out of the system goes through Prospect before it reaches your home. Now, a commitment to swimming obviously means that you're going to have to do something. You either accept a risk that cryptosporidium is going to be an issue for the population, which I don't think is going to happen, or you put water treatment in the water treatment plant. And this is where this latest number of 1.2 billion for a UV light has come from. So if, water, if swimming is going to be accepted, it would seem that recreational fishing would be as, as acceptable, if not more acceptable, because the, being in the water is more incidental, because, and it's really only because you're falling out of your kayak or you're wading or something like that. So to me, it's a great opportunity for New South Wales fishers. Uh, if you're seeking to try and get access to your reservoirs, I'd suggest that you know perhaps that's something you need to take a hold of and, and run with. Um, but you know, there will be strong resistance from the water authority. Uh, one question for Danny. Um, have you given any thought to what's going on with all the pumped hydro that's being promulgated, uh, well, or t discussed at least, if not uh, executed, and how that might impact some of these um, fisheries, particularly um, near near some of the capital cities like yeah. like Sydney and Brisbane and so forth? Yeah. yeah. So one of the reservoirs of which we talked about, Baruta Reservoir, has got a concept plan for pump hydro there at the moment. And we see it's an entirely compatible development. It's basically water to generate electricity. There's no potability there. They're not going to supply to houses. The water quality in terms of things like turbidity, etc., is not as critical, even though there are impacts on the efficiency that of the hydro scheme. So we would imagine, like we see in the snowy region, fishing in those reservoirs is a wonderful thing. Perhaps your question may be also relating to the, the reliability of the water supply itself. You know, what are we going to see in the reservoir that may already be used for fishing? Uh, are we going to see fluctuating water levels or low water levels, levels which are going to impact on the stocks? Quite potentially. Um, but, you know, in the larger reservoirs, if you're buying them that, we see you know, some good fisheries being maintained, or will be a different impact. So, yeah, I'd like to think again that if they're building new ones, it should be coming in at the, in the first instance. Right, we'll call it there. If you've got any more questions, I'd say catch up with the speakers, a uh, cup of tea. Otherwise, I'd just uh, like to give the speaker one more hand for everyone. <laughs>